Hey everybody, it's Party Elite, and today we're taking a look at some of the greatest games that released in some form or another in 2021 that you may have missed. It's been a densely packed year, and we've had some excellent releases, and while some games get all the coverage and attention, many get lost, missed, or forgotten despite how great they may be. As always with this channel, you can expect this video to focus on strategy, tactics, RPG, management, city building, and sim games, and I hope this video helps you find some great titles from the year that you may have otherwise left behind. If you have any gems of your own you'd like to share, leave them in the comments down below so we can highlight all the great games that deserve more attention than they got. Now, without any more time to waste, let's begin. Game Deck did not get nearly as much love as it deserved. Releasing in September, it brought a new cyberpunk RPG into the mix, one where your choices actually mattered, and one where the setting was more than just set dressing. You're a game detective, needing to jack into virtual worlds to solve crimes using your wits and charisma. A non-combat isometric RPG like this survives on its storytelling capabilities, and with Game Deck throwing you into the thick of things right off the bat investigating a rich CEO's son's misadventures into the virtual spaces, you'll see some pretty interesting storylines pretty much right away. As an avid tabletop RPG fan, I always look for CRPGs that at least try to replicate the feeling of freedom that comes on tabletop, and Game Deck did a really good job of not holding my hand through the experience, allowing me to make mistakes, experiment, learn, and grow. Whether this is with regards to conversations or actions, Game Deck did a really good job of making me feel like I was in charge. The game also does a great job of embracing its context. Multiple solutions to a single problem are a basic expectation in an RPG, but the solutions rarely include options like hacking into a game and changing your skin to look like a cat so you can sneak past a bunch of guards and gain entry to a secret chamber where additional clues are available. There are a lot of elements at play that open up your options or close them off, and this really encourages multiple playthroughs, even when you have the answers to the mysteries at hand, and even though the narratives themselves are a little linear. On which note, those mysteries themselves are quite interesting to solve as you look for clues, pulling the trigger on a suspect, or on a conclusion I suppose, based on the information you've been able to gather, and based on conclusions that you can draw as a result. Game Deck pokes fun at the genre and has a lot of meta references to video games as a whole. It does a lot of things that can only really be justified in this context, and that's always what makes something like this extra special. It's not just a generic noir detective game in a cyberpunk setting, it actually embraces what makes that setting special, and really runs with it, taking you to different game worlds with different themes and aesthetics, and a seedy underbelly that connects it all. Honey, I Joined a Cult is a colony management game with a hilarious premise that released into early access in September of this year. As the name might imply, you're put in charge of a cult, from picking its name and designing its outfit, to establishing its practices and acquiring followers. You need to establish the grounds, building separate rooms for different kinds of activities, ranging from sleeping and eating to researching new technologies and alternative methods to spread the faith. And while you start with a few devout believers and the cult leader to get things going, you'll need to establish a reception area and rooms for various activities to help indoctrinate new followers who you can then use to expand your operations. Sending your followers on missions outside of the compound can help spread awareness of your cult, attracting more potential followers, but it can also get the cops interested in your little operation, potentially getting your whole operation shut down. There are a lot of moving parts in Honey I Joined a Cult that make it stand out from the usual colony management game. With such a unique premise, I'm glad to see it not just embrace the quirky aspects of the topic at hand, but go well above and beyond in some of its interpretations of cult activities. Beyond the tongue-in-cheek humor, though, you'll have to partake in some serious management as followers have moods and preferences, as your cult leader needs to be in top form to lead daily sermons, and as your limited resources can get spread quite thin if you make improper use of your funds or your limited influence. Despite the sense of humor and comedy, there is a very serious management game at the core of Honey, I Joined a Cult, and the early access gameplay already includes a massive chunk of features and shows off some of the dark paths your cultists can follow, with plenty more to come down the line. I've had a lot of fun with Honey, I Joined a Cult so far, and I think it's well worth checking out. War Tales sort of snuck in at the tail end of the year, releasing into early access in early December, and already seeing some sizable updates during the holiday season, making it very clear the devs mean serious business. 
And of course they do. These are the same folks that made Northgard and are tasked with developing the upcoming Dune Spice Wars game too. You're looking at a quality team that makes quality games. The easiest comparison to make with War Tales is to Battle Brothers. There are similar elements, yes, but significant differentiators that can't be ignored either. Don't just leave it at that comparison. War Tales is an open world sandbox RPG where you control a band of adventurers. You'll be traveling from location to location, taking on quests, recruiting new adventurers, buying or crafting equipment, and engaging in all manner of activities, good and evil, as you try to make your mark in the world. Real-time map navigation is paired with turn-based tactical combat and beautiful visuals to create a nice immersive world with some pretty solid storytelling already. Exploration and experimentation is encouraged as you unlock new options through discovery, like professions that your adventurers might take on to help the party, or abilities for your party that might come in handy in saving your skin, and the existing story of the world acts as an interesting backdrop for you to make decisions in. From refugees to beggars to bandits and merchants, you can choose who to side with and how, eliminating ne'er-do-wells or stealing from traveling bands to make ends meet, avoiding or assisting the law as needed. Company management, character leveling, equipment crafting, and the appropriate use of skills and abilities all have interesting tweaks from the usual formula as you seek out specific professions, engage in Mini games for lock picking and smithing, etc., etc., determining what to do when camping out in the wilderness, or simply trying to establish the perfect combinations of moves on the battlefield. War Tales is already an interesting game, well worth your time and money, and it only just entered into early access. And I can highly recommend checking it out, even in its current early state. High Fleet was one of the greatest surprises of the year, showing us that the developers at Microprose still have a few tricks up their sleeves in making compelling experiences with interesting stories. Set in a diesel-punk alternate reality that has some very strong Soviets in the desert vibes, you're put in charge of an aerial task force that needs to strike at the enemy capital in the middle of a war that would see your people obliterated. With your nation on the back foot in this invasion of your sovereign land, you must seek out allies, liberate cities, and avoid detection lest the enemy send their more powerful fleets to intercept and destroy yours. Between snooping in on communications between enemy forces and plotting out courses using rather traditional tools, you'll be fully immersed with High Fleet's diegetic user interface where every knob, button, or dial bridges the gap between your mouse clicks and the actions you're trying to execute. It is honestly one of the most immersive experiences I've had this year, and I've spent some time with a VR headset strapped to my face in other titles, so that's really saying something. This is so much more immersive in so many ways. Engaging in conversations to convince people to join your cause while designing custom ships for evolving circumstances are all part and parcel of the procedurally generated campaign playthroughs where, though your end objective might remain consistent, your path to said objective is anything but. Combat itself is extremely intense as you take these customized ships toe-to-toe -to -toe with enemy fleets, fielding one of your ships at a time against the engaging foe, using mouse and keyboard to fly, shoot, and use countermeasures and special abilities as best as possible, arranging the order of your ship's arrival to maximize on whatever strategies or tactics you have in mind. Damage taken needs to be repaired at ports at potentially overwhelming costs, and your first few playthroughs might end in disaster, though your progress directly funds your following playthrough, giving you access to more points with which to build your initial fleet. High Fleet has been a lot of fun. It's got some great systems, a great sense of style, and I can highly recommend checking it out. I've got a separate video in which I go into more depth about it if you're curious, and I'll link it under the I at the top right corner of the screen if you want to check it out. You might have seen the video I recently released about Star Dynasties that highlights everything that makes it interesting, but if not, I can highly recommend checking it out. The game, I mean. Well, the video too, but the game more so. Having released in September after a short stint in early access, Star Dynasties didn't get much love at first, including from myself, but after watching Dune a couple times in theaters this year, I went back to it with fresh eyes and I've had a great time. Star Dynasties is basically Crusader Kings in space, which is pretty much what the universe of Dune is, at least as far as the movie is concerned. It's about families engaging in all manner of nefarious plots to dethrone each other and establish themselves as the hegemons. In Star Dynasties, 
you take control of one such family, acting as its head character through generations, engaging in all manner of character interactions from assassination and seduction to alliance brokering and feuding. You expand your realm through war or diplomacy, taking advantage of familial bonds where possible, or using sedition and rebellion to encourage the fracturing of particularly powerful targets, swooping in to liberate or subdue as needed. In this far future setting where humanity has fallen into a new dark age post-space colonization, there is an interesting blend of futuristic sci-fi technology and medieval feudalism that acts as a fun playground focused around role-playing. Even combat is reliant on character interactions as you try to get your vassals and allies to join you, hoping that you've played your cards right and they remain loyal to you due to your past interactions, and perhaps hoping that the opposite is true on the other side of the conflict, where disgruntled vassals might betray their lords at their time of need. You'll spend less time picking and choosing between which exact building or ship you need to build, and more time deciding whether to throw a wedding party and which cousin of yours should be sent on which assignment lest they turn out to be a turncoat or incompetent. Star Dynasties puts an interesting twist on the genre, and if Crusader Kings in Space sounds compelling to you, I'd strongly recommend checking it out. It really got the short end of the stick when it released, but this is a definite gem from this past year. Timberborn is a city-building colony management game with an excellent twist. You're in charge of a beaver colony. A lot of the time when games implement a cheeky twist like this, it's nothing more than set dressing, but with Timberborn, it drives pretty much every part of the process. A lot of the structures you build can stack atop each other, making verticality a key gameplay component, and a lot of the gameplay revolves around controlling the flow of water, and quite a few categories of the tech tree and the building options alike are all about harnessing and managing water to overcome issues like flooding or droughts that can all result in a mass extinction uh, if you're not careful. Working with elevation is an immediately relevant and important aspect of the game as you gain access to higher and lower regions of the colony to either acquire resources or to simply expand into, and as you keep an eye on basic needs like food and water, so too will you keep an eye on the flow of electricity and the overall happiness level of your beavers. Though the game is in early access, it has quite a few fun production chains implemented already, and it's getting constant updates, with the latest having dropped just a few days ago, bringing with it new kinds of structures and resource acquisition methods, as well as new recipes, new ways to control the flow of goods, and new attractions too. Timberborn is a very impressive game, even in its early access format, giving you the ability to build all manner of interesting colonies in a context that opens up some very fun options. Apart from the obvious sense of humor a game and topic like this has, you'll be doing some pretty serious management work, and it is very possible to make a wrong move and have your entire colony get wiped out. I would know, I once slid a river flood, killing all my crops, leading to death either by starvation or, ironically, thirst. And have you tried drinking the water you're drowning in? It doesn't really work out. There are plans for multiple beaver factions that have different strengths and weaknesses, and it looks like the developers have lots of great ideas on the horizon some of which we're already seeing. If you like city builders and colony management, I think you'd be very happy with this one. City of Gangsters takes us to the Prohibition era in a way that I don't think I've ever seen done before, focusing on the interaction between characters of different kinds and using a turn-based approach that focuses primarily on the business and relationship side of things and less so on the combat or gang war side of things. City of Gangsters will have you building up a crew and using action points between all members of your crew to drive around the city, interacting with store owners, establishing fronts, collecting protection money, and growing your turf, all while fending off other gangs and building relationships in your community. City of Gangsters focuses on acquiring and processing raw materials into finished illicit products and then selling them throughout your network of rackets. There are a variety of end products, each worth a different amount and involving a different level of legwork to produce, and each sells to a different kind of clientele and a different kind of front. You'll drive around, turn by turn, going from corner to corner, engaging with shopkeepers and trying to improve your relationship with them by either cutting them a deal or through word of mouth. Managing relationships between people in the city is a matter of treating everybody appropriately. One too many instances of intimidation can build a reputation which means others don't want to work with you for fear of repercussions, but if somebody owes you a favor and puts in a good word for you here and there, you're off to the races. 
Favors are used to improve relations, open up new opportunities, or establish fronts that store the protection money your enforcers collect from the nearby corners and the stores that have signed on for protection. And your crew will actually have to physically pick up the money to have it be available for use. These physical, tangible resources make for a neat bit of management as you try to find the most efficient way to spend your action points each turn to make sure things are moving as they need to, where they need to. Setting up automated routes will take some of the micromanagement away as your operation grows larger and larger, but from humble beginnings, you're hoping to create an empire before the prohibition comes to an end and you have to go back to making an honest living. Before We Leave is often talked about as a non-violent 4X game or a non-violent city builder, and the emphasis on that non-violent aspect really goes to show how survival city builders seem to almost be an expectation these days, I guess. Either way, Before We Leave is not a 4X game. It's a hex-based city builder and a critique in some ways of where humanity is headed if we maintain our current trajectory. Set after the planet has been destroyed by an apocalypse, your peeps emerge from an underground bunker to re-establish civilization. The hex-based element that not only brings adjacency requirements, but also provides adjacency bonuses and malices, adds a bit of additional problem solving to the usual fare. Yes, you'll be collecting resources of various kinds to build more advanced buildings. Yes, you'll organize production chains to be efficient. And yes, you'll be performing research through a decently complex tech tree. But as you build houses and establish farms and wells for housing, food, and water, you'll also keep an eye out for the spread of pollution from more advanced buildings and the pollution-fighting effects of things like reforestation. You'll manage the mood of your peeps to make sure they're working happily and efficiently, and their mood is very much tied to the environment in which they live and work. The adorable art style belies the complexity of the systems behind it as you eventually start to build ships to travel to other islands, each with their own biomes and associated resources, benefits, and dangers. And further on, you start to build spaceships to travel to other planets. You'll set up trade routes to ensure the flow of essential goods, and you'll build an ever-growing society across multiple islands and multiple planets until, well, in my humble opinion, one of the ways a playthrough comes to an end isn't exactly what I'd call non-violent, but I'll leave it for you to decide. Overall, Before We Leave is a pretty game with some fun ideas and an ever-growing complexity through each playthrough, alongside some additional modes to play as well. At a glance, it looks like a simple game, but as you delve deeper, you realize it's anything but. Do note also that the game is available on Xbox Game Pass for PC if you're interested, but I highly recommend checking it out either way because it's again, a little different from what seems to be the norm these days, and it does a really good job of capturing a unique feeling, a unique art style, and it's just, again, a bit of a gem. Mini Motorways is not the kind of game that immediately comes to mind when thinking of strategy, city builder, or simulation games, but this beautiful little indie gem is a blend of all those, focusing on one very specific aspect of the city building genre and creating a puzzle game out of it. In many motorways, your sole responsibility is managing traffic in a slowly growing city built on a grid. Between references to real cities, daily and weekly challenges, and more, there are a few different settings and variables around which you'll work to ensure people can get from their home to wherever it is they're headed. Color-coded cars leave color-coded homes, using roads to reach color-coded destinations, and as time goes on, more houses and destinations get added, and you'll make adjustments to your motorways to allow for the efficient movement of traffic. Every so often, once a week in game time, you'll get a choice of which tools you'd like to unlock for future use in your run, and how many of said tool. Traffic lights, roundabouts, bridges, tunnels, freeways, and... Other such options all have their own pros and cons, impacting the flow of traffic in their own ways. As things go on, congestion starts to slow the flow of traffic down and it takes cars longer to get to their destinations. If enough cars aren't able to get to any one of the many destinations for too long a time, your run comes to an end with your score determined by how many commutes you were able to help complete. It all sounds very simple, and the core of it is, but as the layers get added on, each run gets a little more challenging, and you find yourself competing with your own previous high scores, if not with the leaderboards. There's something almost relaxing about playing mini motorways, and it just kind of became a bit of a nightly endeavor for me at one point this year. Just playing a session every night to see how well I could do, coming back day after day to wind down a little with a simple game. 
If you like a game that requires problem solving but asks for minimal commitment, Mini Motorways is a fun and easy title to get into for an hour here and there every so often. It's got a nice art style, it's got a simple premise, but it provides that easy distraction while still proving a challenge, and it's just around 10 bucks. Dorf Romantic is another chill puzzle strategy city building game that doesn't fit the typical mold of the genres, similar to Mini Motorways, though it has significantly more rural vibes. In Dorf Romantic, you're tasked with building a quaint countryside and the little towns that grace it, placing hexes one by one on adjacent tiles, trying to build impressive landscapes and towns by rotating and placing your tiles in appropriate orientations to allow for all manner of beautiful creation as similar edges that are adjacent to each other create combinations that traverse across multiple tiles, adding to your points, and sometimes fulfilling side objectives that get served as a session goes on. Some tiles have restrictions, like river tiles and railroad tiles that need to attach in physically and functionally viable ways, and some tiles will combine a variety of edge types with one of these rigid rule sets like a river that runs alongside a forest, or tracks that exist just outside a small town. Using the tile combinations and your problem-solving abilities, you start to build some really interesting and compelling spaces, and while you can absolutely take it easy and not worry too much about nailing the highest score in a run, for those of us who like targets and goals, there's a constant motivation to try and do better than your last run. To build the biggest forest, to create the longest river, or to establish the largest town. Again, this isn't necessarily the game you'll boot up when you want to crunch numbers or build the perfect interchange, but between the music, the art style, and the relatively relaxed vibes, Dorf Romantic provides a challenge of a different kind for those that seek it, while providing a relaxed, almost meditative building and puzzle-solving space for those that prefer something a little calmer. I had a lot of fun with Dorf Romantic for quite some time, booting it up again, you know, every once in a while for a little stint here and there, just playing for a bit and going back now and then. It's another game that asks for very little commitment, but offers a lot of fun for when you sit down with it. And it also only costs about 10 bucks. There you have it. Some of the great games from 2021 that I think deserve a lot more attention than they may have gotten. If you have any picks of your own that you think need a spotlight on them, let me know in the comments down below. And if you enjoyed this video, don't hesitate to let me know with a like. For more coverage in these genres in the form of news, reviews, previews, let's plays, and more, don't hesitate to subscribe to the channel. And as always, a massive thanks goes out to all of the channel members and patrons who've been supporting the channel on a monthly basis. Y'all keep us alive and running smoothly. And of course, a big old thanks goes out to each and every one of you for watching. Until next time, cheers.